Well, come on, let's clap and thank Jesus together today. Come on, everybody. Come on, let's fire up chapel today. Let's have some fun in chapel. Are you fired up to be here? Ain't nothing better than a good chapel. You know, I used to have to go to chapel three times a week. You, you're blessed. You get to go twice a week. And uh, I just think it's an amazing atmosphere to step in today. I want to first honor the worship team for bringing such great worship and praise today. I want to also honor, what's her name, Abby? Is that who got up? Can, my God. Abby, you got up and did that like you've done that your whole life. I was with a pastor recently, and he complimented himself, as many pastors do. And he said, you know, one of the things about me, his words, is I have an eye for talent. I can spot authority when I see authority. And when you were up there, I was thinking about his compliment about himself. That if he was here, he would say, I can spot talent, and I can spot authority. Some on your life, my goodness unbelievable where's the Caesar salad at my god first of all I'm not an honorary Mexican it's called half <laughs> thank you for acknowledging what my boys call my mustache but man again just the quality and the caliber of the students and the leadership that are from here is I'm um, just blown away. And we know that it's because of the fruit of our pastors. And you know, what's so great is that God loves you enough to plant you in this house today. And I just am blown away because I know who he is, Pastor Chris, and it doesn't surprise me that that's being reproduced. Remember, as a leader, you teach what you know, you reproduce who you are. And so I just want to honor you, sir, and thank you, God, thank God for your leadership and your life. And you can be louder if you'd like to. This is the chapel. Unbelievable. Just thank you for who you are. Thank you for your voice, your faithfulness, your consistency. Thank you for your integrity. Thank you for being um, a believer and a champion of others. And you've done that for me. You've done that for Abby and and a Caesar salad. I think there's a kale salad somewhere over there, but just thank you for being who you are. Come on, clap one more time and thank Pastor Chris. I also want to acknowledge, are all the Prospect students over here? Clap one more time for everybody checking out the cause today. Wow. I remember, I remember being 18 years old. I left Seattle, Washington to go to LA to check out my Bible college that I would go to. And my parents sent me on a plane by myself to go check out the Bible college. I remember sitting in the, in the far back, as far back as I could, because I didn't want to go to Bible college. My plan for my life, listen, it would have been great. I really wanted to be a high school teacher and a high school basketball coach. That was my dream for my life, to be a high school teacher and a high school basketball coach. So I sat in the back of the room and I fought God and I said, no, I'm not coming. And the Lord always wins, doesn't he? And so I just want to encourage anybody that is already surrendered or kind of wondering, let's just believe they're going to hear from God. Let's just believe God will. Come on, anybody believe the steps of the righteous? Come on, clap louder. Are ordered by the Lord. God will tell you what to do. Amen. Turn and give two people a high five. Show them some love today. Find a place to sit down. Amen and amen. All right, if you have a Bible, go to 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 10. You can write down the title of my message today. I want to talk today about building your life. I want to talk about building your life. What a privilege, what an honor to steward the gifting and the talent God has given you. What an honor and privilege to build something great. Any, anybody, by show of hands, you want to do something great for God. Come on, let me just see your hand. You want to do something great. See, that, that spark of desire comes from God himself. I want to talk today about building your life. I like that idea that I get to build something great 
with God. Abby put it so eloquently. When she said her bar, I turned to Pastor Chris and said, I don't have content as good as her today. She said, maybe you're tired because you're trying to do things for the Lord, but not, what was that part she said? But not uh, with the Lord. She said, because I think that if you partner with God, God could help you build your life. God will help you build your future. He'll help you build your ministry. I have started three ministries in my lifetime. The first time I started a ministry, I was 19 years old. I got hired at a church in East L.A. It was where Mexicans live, Caesar. 94% Hispanic was the city I was, I was working in. And, uh, okay, a Mexican. Wow. I like that. God doesn't make quiet Latins. <laughs> we come out the womb loud. <laughs> la cucaracha, la bamba. <laughs> Your mama. <laughs> Dios mío, come on. So this church hired me at 19 to become the high school pastor. And so I, that's where I got my start in ministry. And so the first Sunday there were 17 students in a side room and a piano. And so I played piano and led worship, and then I got up and did the announcements, and then I preached the message, and when they prayed, while their eyes were closed, I snuck to the back door so I could greet all of them on the way out. That was my first ministry. The second ministry I started was when I was 24. When I was 24, I moved back to the Seattle area, and I started a youth ministry in a city called Puyallup, Washington, and that first night that we had a high school ministry, 24 students showed up. And, and, the, and the, the third ministry, the last ministry that I will ever start, please God, in the name of Jesus, I was 35 years old when I moved back to L.A. to start our church, and we started in our living room with 11 people. So I just like this idea about building. I like the idea, remember the Bible says, don't despise the day of small beginnings. I want to encourage you, you may not be where you want to be, but thank God you're not where you used to be. Come on, God is going to help you build into the future that he's called you to walk in. But God will help you. you got to build with God. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 3. According to the grace of God which was given to me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation and another builds on it. But let, let each one... Take heed to how he builds on it. In other words, what the Bible is saying is build wisely, build carefully, build strategically. Nobody just grabs some hammers and nails and some sheetrock and some wood and just builds. No, it takes strategy. It takes wisdom. And I just want to acknowledge and honor him one more time. When I saw that scripture, master builder, you know who comes to mind? Pastor Chris Hodges. Come on, clap one more time. Thank God he's a master builder. It's masterful. How do we know that he's a master builder? We went from the warehouse to the storehouse. Come on, somebody. He's a master builder. And God will teach you, like he taught and trained Pastor Chris, how to be a builder, how to build your life. How to, so I'm going to give you five things today. Write down number one. you got to lean into your future. Lean into your future. I heard a quote recently from Jeff Bezos. If you're leaning away from the future, the future is going to win every time. If you're leaning away from your future, your future or the future is going to win every time. See, I like what the scripture says, Psalm 90 verse 12. So teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. I've always loved that scripture, teach us to number our days. One of my practices in life, I'm always looking at the next 30, 60, 90 days of my life. When I sit down with our team or I sit down with my wife, I look at the next 30, 60, 90 days of my life. I'm always studying the next 30, 60, what's the last one? 90 days of my life to teach me how to number my days that I can gain a heart of wisdom. I can make wise decisions with my time. I can make wise decisions with my finances. I can make wise decisions with my investment. I want to lean into my future because I, I know if I lean away from my future, the future is going to win. But how do I build with God? I'm leaning into my future. 
Oh, I love this concept. I love this idea. I love leaning in so much, I started a podcast that says we're leaning in to leadership. That's what I love about Highlands College. When I walked in today, you could sense that nobody here is going, let's see what goes on. I've been to some chapel services that felt like funerals. And everybody's leaning out like, show me what you got. Let's hear your, do you have a heavy revy today? But I always think God's looking for those that are leaning in. What does he say in Proverbs 4? Lean into wisdom. Call wisdom your sister. Put wisdom around your neck. You lean into wisdom and wisdom will what? Lean into you. Wisdom will promote you, advance you, protect you, give you favor, give you riches, give you honor. We're leaning in. I love that Jesus says it in John 15. He says, lean into me, I'm leaning into you. Remain in me, remain in me, abide in me, abide in me. What is our heart today is to lean into the presence of God. Lean into the will of God. Lean into the plan of God. I want you to lean into your future. Lord, teach me how to number my days. Show me the prophetic vision that you have for my life. Oh, I love this scripture. Look at Proverbs. Uh, go to um, Proverbs verse I didn't put it down. But how about this? I'll just quote it. If you want me to quote it, it's, it's in here right here. Where there is no prophetic vision, people can't. Did I put it? I mean, I don't like to brag, but I have an eye for talent. Where there is no vision, the people perish. Other translations there say cast off restraint. So what would restrain you from not being a gossip? What would restrain you from not being deviant with your behavior? What would restrain you from sleeping in until 11 a.m.? The one thing that will restrain you is vision from God. And vision doesn't come from YouTube. It doesn't come from podcasts. It doesn't come from movies. Vision comes from God. God will use a YouTube, and he'll use a podcast, but I'll tell you, God will use his presence, he'll use his word, he'll use his people, he'll use your pastor to give you vision for where he's taking you, and you can lean into your future. Come on, everybody clap together if you're great. I'm leaning into it. Don't lean out. Don't lean back and do the rock away. No, lean in to your future. Write down number two. Sharpen your axe. Ecclesiastes 10, verse 10, sharpen your axe. If the axe is dull and one does not sharpen the edge, then he must use more strength. But wisdom brings success. If the axe is dull, if the axe is dull one, and one does not sharpen the edge. I love it. There's a scripture in Jeremiah. It says, the shepherds of the flock have grown dull in their hearts. They've grown dull hearted and therefore all the sheep are scattered. When you see a church that's unified, and when you see a church that's on fire for God, when you see a church that's on mission, it's a reflection of the leaders not having a dull heart. The heart is sharp. You ever look around and you see somebody, they, 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 you look in their eyes and you're like, oh, you've been with Hesu. <laughs> Recently, Jensen Franklin came to preach at our conference. Did anybody love Pastor Jensen? Yeah. I love Pastor Jensen so much. I call, he's like the George Clooney of Christianity. He got, that, he got that long hair, don't care. He got that southern accent. I just love him so much. And he got up, and he looked so skinny. He looked like, Pastor Jensen's a runner, so I know he stays fit. But he was extra skinny because he was on his fast. And he got up to preach, and he said, y'all are in trouble tonight. I'm on my fast. And I thought, they don't even understand what that means, but they are in trouble. And he got up that night, and slammed the place because there was something about how sharp he was don't you believe the lie that indulgence will satisfy you it's often what you discipline yourself in it's often what you deny yourself of that brings greater fulfillment and I want to encourage you to sharpen your axe to get sharp to get to get classy to get eloquent to go to a whole nother level. 
I'll never forget when I was growing up, my dad, on Saturday mornings, he would wake up my brother and I to go cut firewood. Again, I grew up in the Seattle area, and my dad, uh, he, he had a buddy that was, uh, had a, he, he would cut firewood for a living, and so he, he would tip my dad off on all the good places. So my dad would wake us up early on a Saturday, and we'd get up. My dad had this big old yellow GMC pickup truck that he had bought for 10 whole dollars. And so we get up in my dad's pickup truck and we'd stop by, we'd get donuts and we'd head out to go pick up some firewood. And we're gonna fill the whole bed of this truck up with firewood. And I'll never forget our roles. My dad ran the chainsaw, your boy was in charge of the ax and my little brother had to stack the wood onto the bed. Anybody thankful for the younger person, the younger sibling needing to do some work? Where are the oldest kids at? If you're the oldest. All the trauma and drama right there. So ain't it good to see the youngest do something for a change? So my dad, my dad would cut all the fire. You know, he, he'd use the chainsaw, and then it'd come to me. And, you know, your boy, you know, your boy got a little bicep going. So I'd work the axe. And I'll never forget, sometimes when I would go back and come through, sometimes it would just split like it was like just too easy, like, like knife in a butter, just boom. Just, and every time I did that, I was like, you know, you know how I roll, you know, got an eye for talent, you know what I'm saying? And so, I, but sometimes I'd hit the thing and boom, boom, just like, oh, you, you wicked and rebellious generation. And I go harder, nothing. What I learned in that time was it wasn't about how hard I was swinging. It was how sharp the axe blade was. I want to encourage you, it's hard to serve God when you're not close to Jesus. The way you get sharp with your blade is you stay in the presence of God. You stay hungry for the waters that flow from the presence of the living God. As a deer panteth for the water brook, so my soul longs for thee, O God. I wrote down four things to sharpen your blade. Pray in the Holy Spirit. Seek the Lord God Almighty. Read the scriptures and develop a strong prayer life. What do you need to be sharp? You don't need to go read another leadership book, although I encourage you to do that. How about praying in the Holy Spirit? You know, the Bible says when we pray in the Spirit, it builds up the inner man. How do you think I was able to take out all those logs? It wasn't my bicep, it's the inner man. Pray in the Holy Spirit. Read the scriptures. Get into the presence of God. Have a strong prayer life. My dad was telling me the other day, my dad recently moved to Palm Springs. I think Jesus also lives in Palm Springs. And he was telling me about his daily morning prayer walks and what he's been praying over my life every morning. He's got a strong prayer life. Do you have a strong prayer life? It's interesting. We have a lot of people that are doing the work of the Lord, but they do not know the Lord of the work. And so the further you go into this thing called ministry and you don't sharpen your axe, someone will look in your eyes and not see life. Someone will look in your eyes and not see that fire. When Pastor Jensen got up and said, you're in trouble, I knew what he meant because he had sharpened his blade. It wasn't because he had written a book on fasting 15 years ago that meant he would be sharp today. No, you got to keep sharpening that blade. Keep praying in the Spirit. Keep reading the Scriptures. Keep getting into His presence. Is anybody hungry for the presence of the living God today? That's why we're not cute or coy. That's why we're not living off old revelation. No, we're leaning into our future, and we're leaning into His presence. Sharpen your axe. Elbow somebody next to you and tell them, sharpen your axe. Write down number three, trust God. Trust God. I want you to trust God. I love that Elevation Worship song. If I could sing, I'd sing it right now. I trust in God. I sought the Lord, and he heard me. And every time it gets into that 6-8 rhythm, I trust in God. I throw up my hands as high as they can go. And I lift my eyes to the mountains where my help comes from. And I tell the Lord afresh and anew, I trust in you. 
I trust not in riches or mammon, in chariots or horsemen, but my trust is in the name. <laughs> Clap like you trust in God today. I trust in God. God will come through. God will provide a ram in the thicket. God will show himself to be true. God will be a promise keeper. God will write the check. God will heal the body. God will deliver that soul. God will bring the prodigal home. God will help me in my situation. Come on, anybody believe today I can trust in a good God? Why do I, why do I cast all my cares upon him? Because he cares for me. And so I trust not in the economy, and I trust not in political leaders, and I trust not in humanity. I trust in the name of the Lord. All my trust is in God, in God of heaven. God will never let me down. Amen. The economy could fail. Political parties could fail. Nations could fail. But my God will never fail. That's why I love that song. I, I wish we could sing it right now. I trust in God. Read Psalm 121, 127. Unless the Lord builds the house... Everybody at Highlands and Zoe Church labors in vain. Unless the Lord guards the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. Unless the Lord builds your life. The Lord will build your life. The Lord will build it beyond anything. In fact, I only have three tattoos. Don't tell Pastor Chris. I have three tattoos. One of them is for my daughter, Georgia. And, and, and my daughter, in fact, yesterday, my wife reminded me that 12 years ago was the day that we received the diagnosis for my daughter, Georgia, and she's now 12 years old. People didn't think that she'd live this long, but anybody thankful today that God has the final word? So I've got a G for, for Georgia. Sometimes I also think that it's for grace, the grace of God on my family, and, and what the enemy intended for evil, I know the Lord will turn around and he'll use it for good. And so I've got, I've got that, and then, and then I've got my, my second and my favorite one is Ephesians 3.20. I don't know if you know Ephesians 3.20, but Ephesians 3.20 has been a verse for me that I've held on. I, I hold on to it so tightly, I put it on my skin to remind myself this is what God can do with a nobody trying to tell the world about a somebody. If you don't know Ephesians 3.20, listen to this one. Ephesians 3.20. Now unto him who is able to do, this is when it gets fun. Like if Jensen was here, he would body this thing. <laughs> now unto him who is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, it's going to get better, far above anything you could ask, think, what's the last one? Or imagine. See, you, you lean into God's presence, and you'll live out Ephesians 3.20. Do you think when Pastor Chris was in Barnes & Noble, and the Lord arrested him to move from where he was to right here in Birmingham, Alabama, do you think the Lord showed him everything that's going on right now? He didn't, did he? But the Lord arrested him to come to Birmingham to start a move of God that is touching the earth. And God was able to build something that is far above anything that Pastor Chris ever asked for, thought of, or what's the last one? Imagine. See, what's so great about God, you know, when I, when I was your age and I started out, again, I started ministries at 19, 24, and, and then again, 35. When I was 19, I laid my life on the altar and I told the Lord, I'm not going to be a high school basketball coach. I'll serve you. Not one time did I ever think, you know, one day I'm going to do this because I'm going to do X, Y, or Z. One time when I was a youth pastor, a pastor from down the street asked if he could take me to lunch. And he had a really big church. And I was, I was at the time I was 24. And I thought he was mad at me. I thought, you know, he's very upset because our youth ministry was growing. So when he asked me to lunch, I thought, you know when a pastor asks to meet with you, you think about all your sin in your life? I'm a pastor's kid. This is how it works. Like whenever the prophets would come in town, I'm like, I'm not coming to church. Everybody's like, Jim LaFoon's here. I'm like, great. I'll see you next week. Shoot. 
So I go out to the barbecue with this guy, and we're eating, and I'm just waiting for him to, you know, grill me, and he's mad. And he says, um, when did you become such a great preacher? And I was 24. I looked at him and said, oh, sir. Oh, sir, I'm not, I'm not a great preacher. And he goes, yeah, you are. He said, my son has been coming to your youth meeting every Sunday night. And every Sunday night he comes home and he can tell me exactly what you preached on and all three of your points. I never thought that I'd be a great preacher. I never thought I'd write a book. I never thought I'd do anything that I'm doing right now. All that I did was say, Lord, I surrender to your future and I give my life to your plan. And whatever you want to do with my life is your business. But I'm going to serve you and I'm going to follow you and I'm going to trust you. And my life, come on, clap if you believe. It'll be exceedingly, abundantly, far above anything you can ask, think, or imagine. Two more things. Write down number four. Keep your eyes straight before you. Keep your eyes straight before you. In other words, comparison is the thief of joy. Don't get your eyes on them. Get your eyes on him. Stop gazing at what they got. Start thanking God for what you got. I cannot offer God what I do not have. I can only present to him today what I do have. I'm th it might be a little bit of fish and a little bit of bread, but I serve the God that can perform a miracle. If you surrender something to it, he will bless it, he will break it, and he will use it. Amen. And some of us, our biggest problem is you keep on checking out what everybody else got. I call this guy in the church, Pastor Chris, I call him Swivelhead Steve. You ever met Swivelhead Steve? Swivelhead Steve is at a church, but he's loving all the other churches. Wow. Look at Elevation. Look at the Voos. Look at, oh, wow. Look at High Wall. Look at Bethel. Look at, oh, wow, Transformations. And let, no, I'm grateful for all the other churches. But there's no church like my church. And there's no city like my city. And there's no spouse like my spouse. And there's no kids like my kids. And I'm keeping my eyes straight. I don't look to the right or to the, come on, that will mess you up. Look at what the proverb said. This is wisdom. Let your eyes look straight ahead and your eyelids look right before you. Ponder the path of your feet and let all your ways be what? established, built, strong, future. How do you get your life established and build it? Keep your eyes right here. You ever drive, that's why in L.A. you got to be careful with billboards. We got a lot of billboards in L.A. You're driving down the road, Sunset Boulevard, I can see the peripheral, the devil. <laughs> devil in a red dress. Uh-uh, I'm anointed by God. Uh-uh. Scrolling through my phone. Uh-uh. I'm anointed by God. Keep your eyes straight before you. Remember, your eyes are the lamp to your soul. And you got to protect your... I want to encourage you, young person, hear me. You need to guard your eyes and you need to guard your ears. Because the content you consume will eventually become the content you create. And so be careful what come, watch those precious little eyes. I will set no vile thing before my eyes. I will put what is wholesome and I will meditate on what's praiseworthy. Keep, don't, get, don't look at them. Don't look at anything that will harm you or hurt you. Keep your eyes straight before you. My eyes are fixed on Jesus. Who is he? The author and the fit. Let's just say the builder of my life. Do you believe it today? So I'm going to keep my eyes straight in front of me. I'm not going to look to the left. Wow. Wow. You got a Tesla? My boys, we see a lot of cyber trucks in LA. And my son the other day, he saw a cyber truck. He said, Dad, how come we don't got a cyber truck? I said, son, why don't you go to bed at night? <laughs> he went like this. <laughs> if you got us, I don't, I don't, what you have, great, I'm glad. 
Do you realize while you're jealous of somebody else, somebody else is jealous of what you got? You know how dumb comparison is? Let me just talk about comparison. It is so foolish for you to compare yourself with somebody else because you did not start where they started. You, didn't, you don't have their last name. And we pray that God will use you with your children to give your children a head start and you can continue to build a legacy for your family. But you didn't start where I started. And you don't have my parents. So it's foolish for you to compare yourself with anybody because God, I heard someone say years ago, never despise the unique way that God chose to raise you up. Don't despise it. It's a beautiful story of redemption and restoration and the power of the gospel. Can everybody clap together and thank God. <laughs> Keyboard player, come join me. Let, last one, number five. God will establish your name and your reputation. God will establish your name and your reputation. I love this about God. God will give you a great name. Last verse, Genesis 12. What does he say to Abraham? He said, Abraham, I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. Having a great name comes from God, not from promotion. So I'm glad that you're a networker. Believe all the networking to God. Because God can take your name in places that you never dreamt. And when you're building your life with Jesus, he'll have people bragging about who you are behind your back rather than you telling somebody, you know, I got an eye for talent. I don't know if you knew this about me, but man, do I spot authority. Okay, Captain Kangaroo, thanks a lot. God is the builder of reputation. God puts weight on a name. When they say Highlands around the world, when they say Highlands around the country, Church of the Highlands, something's on it. That's sovereign. God says, I'll bless you. I will make your name great. And let me just encourage you. Maybe you have a checkered past and you did a lot of dumb stuff in your past. Aren't you grateful for the grace of Jesus? and the forgiveness that's found in Christ, and the freedom that we see at the cross. God, all the way back into the Old Testament, can turn around a bad reputation. If you don't believe me, ask Rahab. Doesn't matter what you did. It matters what you're doing and what you're building with God. And I just want to encourage you, you don't have to self-promote. If you're good, they'll find you. If you're good, God will promote you. My Bible says promotion cometh not from the east nor the west. Promotion cometh from the Lord. And what God sets in motion, no man can cancel. We live in a cancel culture where man wants to cancel people. And God, man wants to write people off. You said something bad. You did something wrong. We don't like what you believe. You don't Listen, if God is for you, who can be against you? It doesn't matter what a man thinks. It matters what God thinks. And if God wants to bless you and God wants to promote you and God wants to advance you, that's his business. But all I'm doing is building my life. And I'm building it with fear and trembling. I'm building it. Lord, scrub my motives. Lord, help me to be a holy man, a righteous man. Let me walk in the fear of the Lord. Let me make wise decisions. Let me build my family and build my marriage. Let me build a ministry, God, that would reflect your glory. Let me build something that's in the scriptures, God. Let me build something like, it, like it's in the book of Acts, Lord. And Lord, without you, I can do nothing. Unless you build it, I'm laboring in vain. But Lord, here's all my effort and here's all my talent. Use it for your glory. Amen to that. Why don't you stand to your feet? Jesus, we just say today that we are yours, wholly yours, committed to you fully. And we're not leaning back, coy and comfortable and cute, wanting convenience. We're leaning in, ready to sacrifice. 
If you're all in on God's plan for your life, lift a hand to heaven. Father, I pray today for surrender. I thank you for surrendered hearts and surrendered hands. I thank you for prophetic vision right now. Come on, lift your hand higher. Father, I thank you. Right now, give somebody a word. Lord, a word in season. Show them an image. Show them geography. Show them an occupation, God. Give them a scripture. Lord, thank you that in these last days, you said you'd pour out your spirit. Our sons and our daughters will prophesy. Our old men and women will dream dreams. We want more more of you, God. We want more. We're hungry. We're desperate. We want all that you have for us. So we thank you right now, God, that you will build our life. And even if the vision tarries, we trust it will come to pass. It will come to pass in the name of Jesus. Thank you that you said those that delight themselves in the Lord, you will grant them their heart's desires. Lord, I pray for anybody that wants to be a position of an overseer, anybody that wants to be a pastor or leader. I thank you that you said anyone that desires the position of an overseer desires a good thing. Let it be a good thing today. Let it be a God thing. Those that want to be used by the master, we thank you for it. In the matchless name of Jesus. And everybody said together, come on, clap and thank God together. Come on, can you all help me honor Pastor Chad Veach for that message today? We're just so grateful that you would be here with us on a Thursday for chapel and Even in our pre-service huddle today, so many students sharing stories of how your life, your ministry, your books have impacted all of us. And today, how many of you were impacted by that message today? Come on, build your life. It was incredible. Thanks again. One more time, help me honor Pastor Chad and thank him just for being here, pouring into us. He is family here at Highlands. We love you. And uh, one more time, if you could help me honor our impact guest with us today. None of this is possible without our impact guests, and we're so grateful for you for pouring into HC and even allowing us to have chapel and be here in this service. But it is Discovery Day. We do have a few announcements before we head out today. How many of you are excited for Half Marathon Week coming up this Saturday? And we have our expo tomorrow. Anybody excited for our first ever expo happening on campus? We got our brand new HC merch that we're going to be selling at the expo. You can pick up your race day bib. You're going to get your uh, free t-shirt. We're going to have some other vendors there, some acai bowls, some coffee. It's going to be a whole lot of fun. Stop by the expo tomorrow to get everything you need to be set up for success on race day. And then Saturday, it is race day. It's our half marathon. And for those of you here for Discovery Day, really a half marathon, it's what we love most here at HC, right? Come on. Half marathon, it is a staple in our character formation pillar. And uh, really, um, we do this half marathon race because we're building character here at HC. And how many of you know in life there's going to be obstacles, there's going to be adversity, and we're building some tenacity to overcome that as we run 13.1 miles this Saturday. It's going to be awesome. But you all are dismissed. Have a great day. We'll see you all this weekend for the half marathon.